Uh, now you see the title, The Importance of Feeding Wild Birds. Um, well, I'm sure a lot of you think that it is important and, and, and that's great. Um, but what I'm hoping to do by the end of this, and it will take about 45 minutes and there'll be plenty of time for questions, is push that a bit further and communicate that actually feeding wild birds has a really important role to play engaging the wider public and caring for our nature and environment in a context of uh, uh, arguably an environment um, well not arguably an environmental crisis um, many of you will here will feed wild birds and will understand that the enjoyment you get from that um, but i believe it has further potential and can be used, if you like, in our conservation toolkit. So let's start off with a, a couple of postcards that I've dug out, which gives us some kind of context of how deeply embedded in our culture feeding, feeding birds um, is. This is a postcard from post-World War I. It's around the mid-1920s, and there's obviously a scene from Trafalgar Square when we could feed pigeons and I think it's really good in, in showing how diverse the people are either they're actively in the uh, pra practice of feeding birds and there's some and but others are just interested in passively watching and we've got a very well dressed lady in the foreground with a toddler a couple of ladies with bags probably with feeding for the birds in the foreground a policeman talking to a man with a pigeon on his hand um, and a couple of people in uniform a really diverse bunch and i think it's a good example of uh, of um, how important it was then and how important it is now um, but not just in our culture if we go back about 10 years this is from about 1912 it's a french postcard uh, depicting uh, a chap called Henri Paul, that's P-O-L, um, if you haven't come across him, a fantastic individual who fed birds for over 30 years uh, in the Tuileries in, in Paris in France. Um, he worked in a local post and telegraphs office and started obviously using the park as for lunch and then got in, in, into the habit of feeding birds and then turned it into this performance art. Um, and look at those, look at all those people in the background just mesmerized by his uh, act. Um, he's got all the sparrows in the foreground and uh, he's obviously feeding wood pigeons by hand on his knee, on his shoulder, on his hat. Um, and this guy, he, he developed it so uh, to the extent that uh, many of the postcards that you see, there's quite a few, if you just Google him on the net, you'll come ac across these postcards. Many of them were actually produced by himself. He had a little cottage industry and he wrote a little book about feeding birds. Um, and he, to the extent he talks about all the names of the sparrows that he named and the characters they had. So it's a thing that is in, deeply embedded in many cultures. Um, we'll go on to see how worldwide it is. Um, so let's just have a quick run through of what, how it's going to go in these 40, next 40 minutes. Um, because it's, it is a massive um, practice on a lot of different parameters. So we'll do a bit of background about the actual industry, of the bird feeding industry. And, but the whole of this is really centered around a study I did a few years ago about what are our motivations to feed wild birds? Why, why do we do it? And it may seem obvious that it's about pleasure, but I wanted to, I was really interested in our interaction and see if there was other reasons that we may feed birds. Um, and to do that, one of the things I did was look at the history of feeding birds, and then I talked to many people about why we feed birds. And then through this presentation, we'll do a little bit of discussion and a conclusion. And then uh, I'll be ready to hopefully field any questions. So let's have a look at the background. So I say it's massive. It is massive. It's worldwide. Um, 
So at the top left, we see Buddhist monk feeding pheasants. On the top right is a picture, I think it's a lady. This is Italy, a lady feeding um, pigeons. And then on the, the left, we have uh, uh, some rose-breasted cockatoos in an Australian garden. And on the right is a friend of mine, Dr. Jim Reynolds, Reynolds who studied scrub jays in Florida. And he's got one on his hand, feeding one on his hand there. And, and, as, and as I say, that's good. I say on the, the slide, there's formal and informal feeding. So what I mean by that, formal, when we've got sort of bird feeding furnitures, like where we see the um, cockatoos, that's a more formalized type of feeding, but there's a more informal feeding where we're just sitting on a park bench and maybe feeding the pigeons. Um, both are obviously different forms of uh, 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 feeding wild birds. Um, and like Le Charmeur d'Oiseau, Henri Paul, that we've just seen, we can all do it. Um, I get into the habit on one of our local commons of taking peanuts or picking up acorns and putting them on the ground. And it gives me, I'm like the Pied Piper of the Corvids and the carrion crows follow me. And it's, it's really fascinating because it, it allows me a much closer picture of the bird themselves. And they're beautiful, stunning birds close up. They've got, they're not just black, they've got about four different cues. Um, and usually, obviously, as, as we all know, crows actually have got, a, they do fly from a, quite a, Long, uh, long distance when they when you you approach them but got a handful of acorns you can get much closer to them um okay so we've seen it's a worldwide thing it, it is we'll see it is uh, more prevalent in certain countries but it's also massive in terms of in the uk of how many people are involved in it there's lots of figures that tend to be bandied about but it, it, it it's around uh, whatever source you look at, it's around a 40 to 50 percent mark of uh, UK households are involved in some kind of wild bird feeding. And that's discounting the more informal feeding of when we're down the park feeding the ducks and the geese. But importantly for me and what we're I'm trying to communicate tonight is this is actually a lot of us aren't involved. It's a big business. It's a seriously big business. In the US, four to six thousand million dollars per annum, a total of 450 million kilograms. Now, these figures to me are just, I, I just can't imagine them. If we come down to the UK, it's, it's still massive figures. The seed in the industry is worth 300 million. Um, it's, it's, it, it, again, it's from different sources, but most of the sources are near the 300 million pound per annum range rather than the 200. I tried to look at figures of other industries, it, it, but it still didn't really help me sort of get my head around it. But it's something like the golf, the golfing industry in the UK is worth around that sort of amount. And 60 million kilograms of feed. Um, and to get my head around that, that apparently uh, is enough feed to fill 24 Olympic swimming pools. And still, I can't get my head around it. But it's a, all I'm trying to put across is it is a big industry. There are farmers out there and that's all they do is they grow seed for our birds in the back garden. There are industrial sized silos, there are industrial sized warehouses, they, uh, these seed companies employ hundreds of staff. And as you can see there, that's a picture I took at Bird Fair when we could go there a couple of years ago. And that's, that's a 40 ton tr truck uh, dispensing 25 kilogram sacks of seed to us. It's big. Uh, and not only that, it's growing. And it's growing, it's a, it's a worldwide growth in the industry. So yes, it is much more of a common practice and traditionally so, particularly garden feeding in the UK and Northern mainline, uh, mainland Europe. And that has a history of because of colder winters. And um, so where arguably the motivation to feed birds was 
or the birds. Um, there may have been other things going on and we'll see that. Also, we've seen from the figures that it's massive in the States um, and Canada. And it's also big in Australia where, but in, in these three areas that we've talked about, Northern Europe, USA and Australia, the cult, there are big cultural differences and there are differences in the motivations of why people feed. For instance, in Australia, a lot of the conservation bodies, unlike the RSPB and BTO, say actually don't feed the birds. And they have their reasons. Um, it's often tied to reserves where there may be mammal, uh, large mammals um, around. And so they're a bit concerned about people uh, leaving food around. Also, there's a difference in the culture. Um, obviously, Australia doesn't suffer from these harsher uh, European winters, and you can get people with their barbecues in the back garden, and their performance art is more likely to be something like throwing a, a burger to a magpie or a corvid of some kind and watching it or showing off to their neighbours of how it can catch it in the air. A bit like, I suppose, the red kites on the M40 corridor, where I hear the same sort of thing goes on. Um, the worldwide, it's only it's it's particularly likely we we think uh, to increase as an industry um, as 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 the, as the world as the trend uh, of urbanisation all over the world increases. As I say, it's something that's endorsed by the RSPB and BTO. Not only that, their endorsement has changed over the years. It was uh, a winter practice, but both, are, both of those organisations do endorse year-round feeding now, which has also increased the number of people who are involved and also the amount of seed that's sold. And that, that, that was something around early 1990s when that sort of driver occurred. And of course, it comes with additional benefits. And this, the engagement part is really what I'm interested in. And we know that it also has the potential to be a stepping stone into conservation, uh, to join in a conservation group. And there are obviously citizen science projects that probably many of us here are already aware of and probably are involved with the Big Garden Birdwatch and a similar initiative in the States called the Great Backyard um, Bird Count. Um, and yes, I'm not going to leave you uh, with the, uh, uh, I'm still going to harp on about it, that it's still got, although we may all do, it, there is still a massive untapped potential as a engagement resource. So before we go into uh, the bulk of this about uh, what motivates us to feed the uh, wild birds, let's have a quick look at some history. My belief is we always did. We certainly know that the cavemen had uh, some kind of relationship with birds. You can see this owl drawing here. Um, you can find sources also that the uh, the traditional Hindu religion uh, three and a half thousand years ago would talk about you must provision not just birds but animals as well in the wild and we know also that the Egyptians had very close relationships with not just the ibis but falcons and they would they were growing like us they were growing they had fields uh, growing feed for falcons, just, just for the falcons and not just humans. And certainly I believe that it's, it, it's, a diff, it's much more difficult to disseminate this from text, but I certainly believe also there, was a, there would have been a change um, for when our lifestyle changed from a nomadic existence to being a more static farming uh, existence. Um, I mentioned Mesopotamia because that's the belief where that sort of started and there would have been this real, um, the importance of bread and grain can't be uh, uh, accentuated enough, not just 
the relationship between bread and grain and humans, obviously, but also bread, grain, humans and birds. Um, as my mum used to say, when I used to feed the chickens, the sparrows would come down. Um, when we get, if we look at the UK, the first signs of that you can actually find in text that um, we fed birds was through the Hermetic Saint, or some of the Hermetic Saints, should I say. The first one, Saint Serve, 6th century, you can find out about him on Wikipedia, who had a pet robin, um, and, and not a trapped one, a free roaming robin. And then the, uh, if you dig really deep, you can get, you can get um, uh, a few centuries later, Saint Kentigern and Saint Cuthbert. Uh, I, I want to dispel the myth I'll just go off, off slightly because uh, many of you may have read an article in The Guardian about 10 days ago by a guy called Peter White who talked about bird feeder wars and what was happening to all the birds in his garden when the next door neighbour put up this vast sort of skyscraper of a bird feeder and nicked all his birds. What would St Francis of Assisi have said? Well, St Francis of Assisi, we know there's this uh, picture all around there's several paintings of him addressing the birds there's actually no there's no text about him feeding the birds in fact he was lecturing them on how they should be god fearing um, so I, I want to dispel the myth that Peter White was trying to confirm in his article it's when we get to the Middle Ages and perhaps to, uh, all the way through to the late 18th century we start getting um, more textual knowledge that we fed birds and that's not surprising really we, we, more people started to be able to read there's more text available and feeding wild birds is always then talked about in terms of largesse it's usually rich people it's usually people with big houses and big gardens talking about um, being uh, good to the birds and feeding them and it's not when, until we get to Victorian times and probably the 1870s, the later Victorian times, that it really does seem to accelerate. And that, again, is in line with social changes. It's, it's about more people being able to read and write. Uh, newspapers had been out for around 100 years, so they've really developed into a culture of themselves more people are reading them, more people are, people are writing about them, so that undoubtedly there's going to be more text uh, about uh, or, or, or links to feeding birds. But there are other social changes which are really important in that we know that it would seem that more people were actually involved in that uh, practice of feeding birds. Certainly there was a massive growth uh, in London and probably the other urban, in, urban centres in provi provision of public parks. There was real growth, 1850s to 1870s. Um, and also there was a, a growth in wanting knowledge about natural history. There was the great, there was, people were collecting ferns, people were interested in botany. Uh, and we know that the RSPB had its early beginnings in those later Victorian times. And then there was another point where there was, and it's reported highly widely that we were feeding wild birds, and that's around the early 1890s where, we, where uh, the UK was hit with some particularly harsh winters. For instance, London, the Thames in London was frozen over. Uh, for several winters and people were actually seeing dead birds on their travels uh, so and so there was this uh, uh, what people they so they would see them they would see them on the river they would see these dead birds in the park as they were in their leisure time and so we now get reports of workers um, going on London bridges, feeding the birds out from their hands, or going into the London parks and feeding birds from their hands. 
And importantly, if we this, I'm mean, use this image, which is of a lady. It isn't in those times, obviously. This is a lady in Hyde Park in 1930s feeding black-headed gulls from her hand. But it, what happened was black-headed gulls actually, or gulls, uh, uh, the family of gulls, were, were actually not as numerous um, in London as one might expect until around the 1870s. And people were in actually, around that time, were in the habit of shooting them rather than feeding them. And that was a sort of big change was in 20 years from starting you know, um, from people shooting these birds, there was now people taking time out, people actually workers actually taking time out of their valuable lunch break or uh, break that they had in the day. And, so, and actually um, at home making things to feed birds in this break. Um, quite an interesting social phenomenon. Um, but, it, that, but it was obviously something that did accelerate uh, this interest that we've had in feeding birds. And so to the present day, well, we all know, I mean, I mean even since the 1960s, there's been a massive increase of uh, what I've said is formalization. In other words, all this sophisticated furniture, all kinds of types of feeders, all types of types of food. Um, one of the days where my dad just threw the brake and rhymed out, it's uh, much more sophisticated. The other thing is, is that, you know, we, the sources, um, we can get it from our local supermarket, we can get it mail order from RSPB, we can get it from garden centres. And of course, what I mentioned before, another uh, a big thing is that we, we are now in the habit uh, of year-round feeding. A um, couple of things I have missed that would might be ni nice to talk about was if I just go back a slide uh, and talk about uh, something I've missed, which is uh, quite interested in where this acceleration was in Victorian times. And this, I mentioned this We've got a very close relationship with bread and crumbs and birds. In the 1850s, you, you, there was a big trial and one of the, the defence council um, was talking up the, the character of uh, the defendant by saying he's of good character. He ca carries crumbs in his pocket for the birds. So that, you know, the act, there's the act of giving uh, bread to the birds was seen as a, a good, he can't be a bad man because of that. Also, it was a common, in common parlance that you would not give the crumbs to somebody that you disliked. I wouldn't even give them my crumbs. That, that thing about crumbs and bread is very close to us all and it comes into our feeding of wild birds. And there would have also, the other thing about the Victorian times which I missed out was Famous people were also seen to, uh, to have wild birds and they were free roaming. Florence Nightingale had, a, you probably all know, had a little owl. She kept in her pocket every now and again. And Charles Dickens had his famous raven that he um, made famous in Barnaby Rudge called Grip. These things would have affected uh, and so certainly influenced people in their relationship with birds. Okay, that's the history. Let's be, I'm just going to check if I've gone on too long about that. But no, so let's have a look at why. So this is the, the main part of it, uh, the, the talk tonight. Um, why is it? So we've seen, we've probably intimated that it's around bird survival. It's around our pleasure. It's, and I wanted to really investigate that to see if there was any truth in that, if there was any differences to that. Um, if we look at the science before I looked, uh, before I did this study, there was very little, um, lots, lots and lots of studies on the effects of feeding birds, lots and lots on supplementary feeding, um, but very little had been done on our interaction with birds and feeding them. Um, 
Howard and Jones were the first in 2004 that I can find. And, and their study was actually a general study about feeding wildlife. So that would have included, well, it did include um, mammals as well. Rennie Chapman's is much, uh, is a fantastic. If you get a chance to um, read it, it's a fantastic study. And it's a comparative study of the motivations of Australians. And there's a difference um, uh, in those motivations between Australians and the UK. But again, although a lot of, she does talk about the birds a lot, it was a general wildlife feeding project. And they did confirm what we thought, that major drivers for feeding uh, wildlife is for pleasure and for bird survival. So this is um, how I approached uh, the study. I did it in two parts. Um, the first part was a qualitative um, element, which fed into a quantitative uh, element. Um, so the qualitative was, I spoke to 30 people, as you can see there, detailed, all of them fed birds at home. All of them were in London. And I, we, we talked in many cases for a very long time about feeding birds. And I used a, a, a loose discussion guide and if all, all of them was, were asked uh, the practical details of when they fed, what they fed. Uh, but importantly, moving on to the softer issues, if you like, was what made them? What, what made them? What started them to feed? The trigger, if you like. Was it just family history? Was it something that was handed down? And then moved on to motivations. Often people would have come up with this. Um, uh, there were a few there were a few occasions when I just said, look, why do you do it? Um, but usually within a 90 minute chat, people had, uh, I couldn't get out of some people's houses, understandably, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. So from that, I developed a questionnaire that was put online on SurveyMonkey. Um, it was advertised through London Wildlife Trust and Surrey BTO and uh, it was left online for a period of two months and we got a nice number of people which mean there was a decent amount of data to work with over 550 people that was a bias towards london and the southeast and it was biased towards urban areas but um, what i found what was really good and this is these were self it, it was if you like the sample made itself and it's an almost equal split between people who were members of conservation groups like the Wildlife Trust or RSPB or BTO, but also uh, around 50% weren't. Um, and I think that was interesting to see if there was any differences. And they were only, you know, so they, they might have a nice big mansion in the country, or they might have a suburban garden or indeed they could uh, take part in the survey if they just fed birds from their balcony. Indeed, one of the qualitative interviews was with a person on a fifth floor flat and they had about a two foot veranda and they had a couple of feeders up and they got birds. Okay, before I get into the actual motivations that came out of the research, the biggest thing, and if I didn't say anything else and we stopped here, this is the reason why it's so massive, is because the depth of feeling that was shown to me was in some cases absolutely outstanding. There was one, one respondent after 45 minutes spontaneously burst into tears and just expressed how important it was in their lives. They weren't particularly lonely people. They, they just with, had opened up so much. And this strength of feeling was displayed in lots of other ways by the emotional responses. And some of the quotes you can see there, they are the world to me. That's, that's an amazing thing to say. I don't know what I would do without them. These are honest quotes 
I didn't think I could talk so long about feeding the birds. Yeah. <laughs> so the results, big nine there. So when um, we disseminated all the information, um, we found, uh, well, I found nine major, major drivers, motivations. And they were a mix of anthropocentric, I'd, for us, pleasure being one of them. Uh, and ecocentric, if you like, more for birds, uh, e.g. bird survival. And let's see, these are the nine motivational themes that came out of the research. The pleasure in bird survival, as we've seen, and what we expected. There was another thing, though, nurture, which is slightly different. Nurture is about, it's a bit like gardening, watching, planting, watching things grow, nurturing them, making sure they're healthy. People with uh, children, educating children came out very strongly. And of course, being close to nature, that's, it's such an easy, simple, cheap practice comparatively to be able to get very close to nature. And then there was other elements that perhaps I wasn't expecting, not wasting food. And then the next two are about guilt. Um, the personal atonement is feeling guilty about the damage that I personally have done to the environment. And making amends is more of a human, I feel guilty about what we've done to the environment. And then we get to another driver, which is companionship. Um, so if you like, the birds are my pets. I mean, certainly that was one of the drivers of my mother who would talk about the wood pigeons in the terms of they are my wood pigeons, um, as though they were in a cage. Um, so there we have it. They were the nine major things. Um, and I'll give you an example. I'm not going to go through all nine, but they'd be pretty dry to do that. Um, I don't know whether I've put up yet. Um, so what, how we, how we rated it was we had a simple one to 10 scale, rate pleasure as a motivation. And you can see that there was a really high number of the of our sample rated pleasure as number 10 and a low rating on the zero. Whereas if we look at something like not wasting food as a motivation, there's a more of a, a swing to the left hand side where a lot of people, 180 people said, no, that's, no, that's not my motivation. So you can see that each respondent had a different set of motivations, which is very interesting because that just says it's complex, that it is different for everybody. Because even in this example, you've still got 30 people who rated it as the most as a really important um, motivation. I put it now in a much more simple thing, sort of grading it. So on the left is the motivations. On uh, in the middle, the end number is the number of people who responded. Uh, obviously, there was a lot less on children's education because that question was uh, for parents. Uh, then there's a median figure, and then the percentage. Uh, the last figure, which is probably the the, the figure to take on board is, is about the number of, the percentage, sorry, of respondents who scored six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 added up as, uh, as one of their motivations. Ah, yes, and now I put the link. If you do want to see the dry academia, um, then that's the link for the report. Um, it's in an American journal called Ecology and Society. This is, I think, really interesting. This is the triggers. This is what made, what started you in, in uh, getting involved in wild bird feeding. The, by far the biggest thing is this garden influence. And that has real implications because a lot of people don't have a garden. And it's also a lot linked with the age as well. It stops people of a certain age and where they live from doing it or actually contemplating doing it. Um, I thought 
before I'd done this, if someone had asked me, I'd have gone, oh, it's mother, mum, mums and dads, maybe the grandkids. And it does, they do score highly. You can see like 40% uh, parents. Um, what have we got for grandparents? Less than I thought, actually, 8%. But it's significant that the garden, 81% of this sample uh, said it was uh, the trigger. Uh, conservation organization so I let any conservation organization be used and they are it is significant number again uh, and the media um, I think is is a growing is a growing trigger and especially with the success of uh, Packham and uh, spring watch and autumn watch okay let's go through this in a sort of more soft away i'm just aware of the time 36 minutes i'm just going to have a quick drink so have I, as i've intimated um, uh, it's it's quite all these motivations mixed together it makes it quite complex and it's come from and it would be different if i talked uh, or spoken to people in America, Australia, or indeed anywhere else other than the UK. And that's uh, one of the things is the cultural dimension. We've had a historical, uh, our historical relationship with birds is a lot to do with domestication and pet ownership. Uh, uh, we have a history of poultry and pigeon keeping. And we also, in the Victorian times, developed um, show um, keeping show pol poultry so not feeding them but feeding them up and eating them and this was victoria queen victoria herself was a avid collector of show birds this filtered this would have filtered down and made the upper and middle classes interested in having show birds as well pet ownership i mean absolutely massive in the 1930s three million caged birds if we think in the 1930s, uh, the population was less than now, it was about 46 million people. Then we think of the households, that's a lot of caged birds. Uh, it goes down by the 1960s, probably mid 60s, it's gone down to about a million uh, caged birds. So it's still prevalent. Um, I certainly remember at a very young age, the next door neighbor having a particularly vociferous and rude minor bird that just swore all the time um and of course we are we are a history we, we, we history uh, culturally of being gardeners and we've just seen the important link with garden gardens and feeding birds and this need to be close to nature well it doesn't it doesn't surprise any of you i know and and we're actually experiencing that during covid is that all your local parks, all my local parks, all local parks all over the area, all green spaces are being trampled on and used. Um, and it's people wanting to get out and be closer and to, to a green environment. And that's great. Um, uh, and it's, a dis it's just a fascinating display of it that we're experiencing. Um, we saw that about not wasting bread. Well, that those themes of austerity. I remember my father. You, you you'll all have your own stories about this, but I can remember my, the only time we had a tablecloth on the table was a Sunday, and at the end of the roast uh, or the end of the pudding, my dad would ritualistically get up, gently take the tablecloth to the back door, open the back door, go to the back entry, and throw the crumbs or whatever the fat out. He wasn't interested in the birds that came. It was just a ritual. When I asked him, what are you doing? He said, well, you don't want to waste anything. I'm feeding the birds. Um, and this, there's this link to poultry keeping in, of course, in World War II, there was this drive uh, to be self-sufficient. And you can see on this George VI uh, postal cover, there's a slogan postmark, don't waste bread, others need it. And latterly, well, we've got two of our drivers were uh, based on guilt. And so I, I feel that that's probably going to be in, has probably actually increased since I've done the, um, 
<coughs> the study. Okay, and there's a recognition that the trigger to feed is often instilled at a young age. Uh, and this is very interesting because what you do get is you get a lot of people who just give up feeding birds when they're, I don't know, in their late teens. And it's not just about being too cool for school and they've got, they're interested in um, partners or they're going to college, they haven't got time. There's all those factors, but it's also when they've, the next stage of life, and maybe they then, they've become um, much more self-sufficient and they're finding their place to stay, particularly in an urban environment, they'll probably rent it. They're probably access to garden space is not theirs. Um, so they're sharing it. Um, and, and, and certainly I was finding that this, what I call recidivism, people getting back into feeding from that type of environment wouldn't be until they've got a garden of their own. So it's a life stage thing uh, rather than an age thing. Um, but it would it, it did did make me understand more why I was it, it, I was finding it difficult to get uh, respondents in their twenties. So some conclusions. Um, let me just check the time again. Um, it's all right saying pleasure. I think this needs to be teased out a bit. It's research is a fine thing. All you all you find out really is that there's more questions to ask. Um, and I felt that during all of this is that there's some actual, there's some really fantastic stuff on the softer side of pleasure, spirituality, wonder and all. And I think this is a really special, special thing. People would say, while I'm doing the washing up, I'm looking out the window and I'll get involved with the birds and then suddenly the water's cold. You get people saying it's like staring into a bonfire it's like staring into a water fountain so it's as though that it, it's it's almost this what we get if you do practice it things like yoga meditation just cutting the brain off and not thinking about the now but going into another space and this was this was voiced in various different uh, ways by people to the extent that people who were non-religious would talk about there is a spirituality about it. However, there is a, another side to pleasure, uh, which is much more selfish, harder edged. It's about, and this was certainly coming through, control, paternalism, subjugation, they're my birds. I don't like it when he puts his up, because they're my birds. Um, so that thing about domestication and control of animals is still there within this pleasure side. Um, I think there's, this, this is the nub of it for me. I think there's a real untapped potential for engagement. And I can't, I can't, well, I've been talking about it all the way through, haven't I? Um, majority of respondents were white. They were over 35 years old. It didn't, that didn't really surprise, surprise me, um, but it should be classless, ageless, raceless, and creedless. Now, the barriers, we can talk about disease and pests, and, and I have met people, and I understand that some people stop feeding wild birds in their gardens uh, because they're scared of the birds getting disease, or parakeets are taking over, or it's attracting rats. But the more important barriers to feeding, why it's 50%, not 100%, is, and it's not really necessarily about class, it's not necessarily about race or creed. Sometimes it is, but it's just lack of exposure to the triggers that we talked about. The other thing is, another big barrier is what I said about 20 to arguably 35 year olds, this life stage thing where people don't feel as though they own their space, so they don't feed. So how do you get around this? Well, I'd like your ideas. There are ways we could go into, because it is a fantastic tool. We know it's cheap. We know it's accessible. We know it works. It's an easy way of getting 
uh, wildlife close. We know people want to be close to nature. We know it's good for them. Okay, so here's one initiative. It's a terrible photo taken by me. It's 200, it's actually 300 year old oaks, boundary oaks in Dulwich Park with its uh, initiative that was, uh, uh, what is that, that greener, safer. Um, the money came from there. And there's two massive feeders. I don't know whether you can quite see them. They both can hold about four kilogram. Um, and there's this amazing um, device that holds them up, that's specially made so that people can't nick the feeders. Um, and it's the driver is for this is engagement it's not about the birds it's about us it's about getting more people engaged the birds if we didn't have those feeders the birds would not die but having those feeders we may have the chance and luckily one day i was down there about a month after they'd gone up and a little girl was dragging her mum along uh, and the father was behind and I managed to get a few words with him and I said um, what do you think of them they've only just gone up and he said I think they're fantastic she's been on about them all morning saying mummy mummy come and look at the birds and I just thought wow if it's just been successful for that one person that is or that family it's worked uh, they're still there there's been problems about parakeets but they've been changed now and stopping the bigger birds hogging the hogging all the feed here's a couple of other ideas um which are about engaging trying to get over these barriers this is a public space uh, sorry the left hand side is a public space close to the south bank uh, but they do have a community garden um uh, set uh, gardener set up and they've got a couple of nice areas it's not just all rye grass although predominantly and on a summer's day it will get full fill up with uh, office workers picnicking on that grass it's an open space um uh, but they realized there was a, a sparrow colony so they thought oh, I'll put up some bird feeders but better not buy any because they'll just get nicked so they decided to put up some plastic bottles put some holes in them put a little shaft of wood in them and hung them up and guess what they got nicked so they decided then to go this route which is basically a soup canister or a milk canister something like that put a hole in the front fill it with seed and guess what the birds love it and guess what they don't get nicked because people just think oh there's a bit of litter up there or they get involved and watch the birds on the right hand side i find this absolutely fascinating this is something i've only just picked up on I know it's not bird feeding, it's bird boxes, and it's an art initiative in Southwark Park where there's several bird boxes being uh, put up and designed by an, uh, a professional artist. It's funded by the Arts Council and Southwark uh, Council. But I don't know whether you can read that, what it says on that. It says, what's birds? And then underneath it says, feathered galdem and spotted Manden. Yeah, I didn't know what, what that meant. I had no idea what's going on. Well, it's street sign. I had to obviously talk to my 19 year old boy about it. And he went, well, Galdem is a com is, is a bunch of girls together. And Mandem is a bunch of blokes together. Brilliant. I think that's just absolutely brilliant much more accessible it's something that well i'm hoping to talk to them to talk to the council about it and see if we can transfer some of that learning from that project to actually uh, bird feeding projects um just bear with me on this um, i'm going to read this out because i do think it's really important future thoughts it's massive this is why it's massive in an increasingly urbanised society, urban green spaces are becoming more important. Yet more threatened, increasing concern that millennials will suffer from an extinction of environmental experience. My son is an example of that. I've talked about it before. He's never heard a cuckoo, so he's never going to miss a cuckoo. 
Um, and that's going to be the same for a lot of people unless you get them involved. Bird feeding offers a direct interaction with wild animals at home and in communal spaces with little financial investment and very little effort. The trick will be to communicate the overriding pleasure that you and me uh, get from feeding birds and the potential care for our environment that this can generate for all our health and well-being. And that's massive. Big thank you to people who helped me on the project, including London Wildlife Trust and my mentors, the Surrey BTO as well, and all obviously the people who, um, who helped me, the respondents. And just this is a plug for my mentor, a wonderful man who's just retired a couple of months ago. So he's an emeritus professor from Brisbane University, Professor Daryl Jones. And if you want to know this is a, a book about bird feeding worldwide it's a fantastic readable book it's not there is science in it but it's not dry science he's he's, he's a great writer he's written several books um so if you really want to know about bird feeding and how it matters and what people do in other countries then it comes highly recommended and wow if you've got any questions that I can't answer tonight, I've left me email for you. And there you go, really. That's a fantastic image of a lady <laughs> feeding some kind of egret. There we go. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, Pleasure. I'd like to unshare so we can all see each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do I do that? Stop share. That's what I do, isn't it? Hello, that's me. Yeah. There we all are. Hello. Here we all are. <laughs> okay. Um, no, that's really interesting. Um, I hope so. I mean, in my case, uh, the reason I started feeding birds and, in fact, really being interested in them was that my mother was quite disabled um and she asked me to build her a bird table so i built her a bird table in the back of our house and i just got interested in the birds that she <laughs> we were watching because uh, she lived backed onto a park and there was woodpeckers and goldfinches and starlings and it was all really interesting so i'm not sure i'd be sitting here now if i hadn't done that so <laughs> it, it does lead somewhere <laughs> and 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 hopefully she enjoyed it as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, she couldn't get out very easily, and so she could just sit in the kitchen and watch the birds. So yeah. Uh, so has has anyone here got any questions? Please just stick your hand up. Or uh, uh, Roddy, does anyone have any idea about how to squirrel proof bird feeders? You anything on that, Dave? <laughs> uh, yes, I've got several things on that. Uh, one, the squirrel feeders that I've been involved with don't seem to work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the ones which that are better are the ones that uh, are involved where uh, it, it's, it's a weight thing so the squirrel lands on it and it, and it closes the entrance to the seed hole whereas when a bird lands of course they're lighter and so they still got access to the seed they they're not foolproof but they're better than normal hanging uh, uh, a table or a normal hanging uh, feeder the i've seen an interesting device was in uh, Dulwich Society newsletter somebody had put up a photo of, and he reckons he'd made his own device to make his feed a parakeet uh, to get rid of the well to stop parakeets um, and apparently it works and it, but it looked like some kind of flying device he put a bit of plastic down and they, I, I, I didn't know how it worked I'll have to go and I'll have to ask him how it works uh, but no uh, I, I can't honestly answer a hundred percent a feeder that will you could enjoy the squirrel's way of doing things i've got a devil of one who takes the top off and then just turns it upside down and eats it on the ground 
I... Dave, you could you could shoot the squirrels. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah, we used I know, to have a bad I, was going to, I, was, I was going to say there is a cruel way that I know somebody <laughs> did, and it's even crueler than that. But I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that. I, I, I can recall years I used to work as a sort of handyman, and and for, for somebody somebody wanted me to put a feeder up for them that the squirrels couldn't get to, and so we decided to put it, hang it on their washing line. Um, <laughs> you know, quite a long washing line. Just and the squirrel just chewed through the washing line. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and the clothes. <laughs> so, so in my garden, the, the feeder hangs on. I've made a kind of arrangement with a pulley with bicycle brake cable, stainless steel brake cable, which it hangs on. And it's got a squirrel buster feeder, which is an American one, which is like Dave said, when when you get something heavy on it, the cage around the outside drops down, and that blocks the ports. So nothing can get anything out of them uh, and as long as you keep it far enough away from anything else so they can't just sort of stand on a tree and reach across uh, they seem not to get it you know they'll jump onto it but uh, as long as they they're on it it will shut up tight and and even the parakeets when they get on that they don't seem to be able to get much out of it because of the shape of their beaks I think but, uh, but my sister has one and she has it quite close to the ground and the squirrel will jump up from the ground onto it and then jump off in such a way that it spins around really fast. And she just showers out of it onto the ground, <laughs> on the ground and eats it. So, really, very clever. <laughs> so the, you know, they'll win in the end somehow. Uh, uh, any more questions? Can I just say, I spent a fortune on those weighted ones and they all stopped working because the squirrels would jump on them and then they don't recoil. So when the birds land, they can't get any food either. And mm. I had to throw them all away in the end. I, I, you know, they're quite expensive, but they just didn't work. The ones I found work for squirrels are the ones with the cages on. Mm. Um, they're, they're... No, I mean, the worst example of that was my sister had one with a cage on it. <laughs> and she went on holiday and one had obviously managed to get in but it got stuck trying to get out again. It must have eaten a lot. And it just died stuck in the, stuck in the grid. Yeah, that, that happens on that Dulwich Park initiative. Uh, it's pretty and, good. And, and it's not um, necessarily that they get too fat. They get freaked out by something. It may be because the sparrow hooks obviously get attracted. Um, and it may be that they actually just, just have a heart attack or something. It's not mm. necessarily that they get too fat. Um, but yeah, it's happened certainly once that I know of. Um, but uh, it shouldn't stop us from using it as an initiative. I mean, and, and I feel really good. Yeah, I'm really proud that it's working. I want it to be used as an initiative uh, more and more um, because I think there's a massive gap there. And the, the other thing is about most of us here feeding birds, people don't know about it. It's in our back garden. Yeah, so we're not communicating that we're not communicating. Well, we may do when our friends come round or when we're talking to somebody, but we're not communicating the, this importance. Um, whereas when it's in an open space, um, in a public space, then everybody's involved. They don't have to have this garden or this privateness. Um, they can enjoy it um, or not while they're out. Um, that that's I think a really uh, and not just for this country I think it's a really untapped potential uh, for other other environments, other environments as, well. as well yeah, yeah. Well, that went a bit, weird, went a bit didn't it? weird didn't it any more questions oh Catherine uh, 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 well a question in a, in a moment but um, just one comment we were out for a walk um, a few weeks ago and some movement caught my eye and a squirrel ran the length of a um, uh, telegraph wire from one telegraph pole to the other. I mean, it ran, it, it, was, it was amazing. It, it, and if it sort of seemed as if it was going to lose its balance, it just went upside down and then the right way up again. So I, I, don't, um, I don't know how thick those are compared with um, washing lines but they didn't look particularly 
um, strong cables, but it, it was quite hilarious. Um, a question about um, caged birds and um, feeding wild birds. Um, uh, what, do you, is there any um, idea about whether feeding wild birds would discourage people from keeping caged birds or might it on the other hand be that if they feed wild birds in the park they might think well I want a bird at home and I could have one in a cage. I think that's a brilliant, can you hear me still by the way? Yes. <laughs> yeah um, I think that's a, a really good question and I haven't thought about that. Um, I do know somebody who uh, wasn't prompted by feeding wild birds into getting a caged bird, but there was some kind of link because they do both. Um, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about that. Um, I don't think that will happen um, on, a, on a massive scale. Uh, I'm more concerned about getting more people just, just using it in, in, in all when we're doing our conservation initiatives, working with local groups, I just want it to be used. I want us to use it in our, if you like, our armory uh, in, in engaging people. Um, it, it, it's just, it's that important um, because we're, I'm not forcing people to um, uh, feed wild birds. What I'm trying to do is just use it as a trigger to get into nature in whatever description and to be just more aware of, their, of people's environment and caring for it like I know most of us do or, or try to do I mean as much as we can. Uh, so that way you know that that's that's really the driving force. I can't reiterate it <laughs> I'm, I'm boring you all now but uh, it, that's I think it really is untapped. Um, Yes, there we go. I don't, yes, but it's a great question and I don't really know the answer, but I'm not concerned about it. I'm much more concerned about these barriers, other much more fundamental barriers uh, to feeding. I suppose I'm um, just to, to, to finish off that um, in this country, um, yeah, I, I agree that it's... Um, probably unimportant. I suppose where it becomes important are places like Indonesia where where I gather that caged bird sort of singing competitions are yeah. and so on are depleting um songbirds, yeah. Um, but anyway, I should have started off by saying thank you very much. That was really interesting talk. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you in a minute, Simon. We've got a couple of questions in chat here. So, um, from Kate Walk, we all hear stories that bread is bad for birds. Is it? Are there yeah. foods that are bad for birds, or do they know what to what they should eat and what not? Uh, well, there's just about thirty-four questions there. <laughs> is bread is bread bad for birds? Yes, if it's totally their diet. I had a I had a real great great thing happen to me where. Uh, there's some floating islands being put in Burgess Park Lake and I, I went along to see him do it and then somebody said oh we've got a school coming along Dave you can talk about five minutes just and, and five minutes later this group of 47 year olds came on oh god what am I going to say so I just shouted at them about feeding birds uh, you don't want to feed every all these birds bread because it's a bit like feeding yourself chocolate all day and nothing else. Yes, it's bad for you. Um, but I'm not against, I don't want to stop the culture of people going down the park and feeding bread. Uh, and actually I've seen really good stuff going on in the local parks where actually more and more people are bringing healthier food stuff for the ducks and, ducks and geese. Um, so yes, bread is bad if it's their only diet. And we know in ducks, uh, sorry, geese, they get this horrible thing called angel wing where the quills come out of their feathers it's awful and they eventually can't fly so they're just uh, predating um, but there's other protein deficiencies there's other things that can happen and in ducks for instance uh, what happens is 
as, as well, you can visually see this, is that it increases aggression, increases heart attacks, it decreases their longevity, uh, increases aggression. Although an interesting study, Australian study again, on this is it actually you get a pecking order within the ducks and it's actually when you're if there's somebody just feeding or there's a lot of us feeding bread to the ducks on a lake it's actually not all the ducks eating the bread it's the dominant ones so it's not bad news for all of them but yes that's the answer with bread uh if it's the only thing um if, if if it's the only thing it is bad news Simon? All right, unmuted. Uh, on Country File two or three weeks ago, they showed Adam the farmer providing supplementary bird food to farmland birds, songbirds, under the Countryside Stewardship Scheme or, or similar. And I'm just wondering, how widespread is that? And is there an impact assessment that the RSPB are aware of or, or anybody, just in terms of how good that is uh, so countrywide? I'm yeah, Simon, I don't know the answer to the, the assessment, and, and I think it's, but I think it's a really good question because it throws up some other things about uh, uh, feeding birds. If people go, you know, we, we're living in an environment where people ask, well, why, is, you know, why are insects decreasing? Why are birds decreasing? And we talk about pollution and in urban environments and there's too many cars and diesel fumes. We talk about the air quality. Uh, we talk about climate change and the changes that uh, has on animals, plants and, and birds. But actually, the big driver of the decrease in birds, as a lot of us know, was in the 1970s by intensification of farming methods. It was farming methods that really drove uh, real massive losses in our songbirds. Now, there is uh, an interesting... Um, academic paper that's quite a famous one on on bird feeding that uh, it's only about 18 months old I'll, I'll just give you the title it's the composition of british bird communities is associated with long-term garden bird feeding long-winded you have to do things like that for scientific titles it's, uh, kate Plummer is the um from the bto it's a bto paper and what that's saying is that uh Birds at our feeder now have, a cha have changed dramatically. The species of birds that come to our feed has changed dramatically, even in the last 10, 20 years. But actually, that's not just because of us feeding birds. It's also because of that massive, the driver that we're talking about in the 1970s that led to the loss of the songbirds. And some of them then going, well, we'll have to go into those urban, more urban environments. And alongside that, the feed got better. Also, more of us are doing wild flat, you know, wildlife gardening, because that's ultimately the wonderful way to go, rather than just hanging your feed up. Uh, it's got more sophisticated, and uh, understandably, there are, there are those changes. What he's doing at that, uh, in Country File, we know that there's this big, out in the country, there's a big issue uh, around February time. There's a a gap. There's, a, there's a food gap and there is death in uh, potentially death in birds um, and so this scheme is very good for that because it's providing a time when there isn't necessarily in those environments natural food uh, it's a great scheme I don't know how, how many farmers oh, take it up, up. And, uh, so, so I can't answer your specific end question, sorry Simon uh, I'm sure you could find out though. I'm sure if you sent an email to, I don't know, who's someone like the, R, the RSPB head office, there may be somebody who could help you there. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, helpful. I'll come to Marie in a moment. Um, RSPB owns a farm called Hope, Hope Farm, um, which it, it's not organic. It runs as a normal farm. It's managed by contractors, but they, they take take advantage of all the available uh, schemes. So they do a lot of that. And they, they will say that their, their bird populations on that farm have increased dramatically since they started doing just the normal schemes that are available to any farmer. 
under you know stewardship schemes so it's worth looking at that that's quite interesting i'm sure you could find stuff about that online um marie you have a question yes well firstly i had a comment about feeding bread because i do occasionally challenge people and i remember challenging this woman because she was feeding a whole loaf oh. to geese and her response was firstly that they were clearly starving look at how they gobble it up yeah. and her second justification was it was a whole meal granary loaf so it was bound <laughs> to be good for them yes so at that point i gave up <laughs> yeah I, I understandably marie and uh, there's always going to be that percentage of people who are just going to ignore you or me or any of us and ignore the signs i think signage is interesting i was years ago i would have been very negative i, I get fed up with don't do this do this in, in a quite personal way so when you see signs going don't feed the ducks it's not really helpful um but i've noticed that signs generally and i've, I've advised certainly southwark have got better uh where they're not so dictatorial uh, one of the most successful signs in locally was, uh, I think it was a little girl actually just did a picture of a duck and said, please don't feed me bread and, and then signed it. And it was obviously a child's drawing and there was no Southern, Southern Council logo on it. And you could see that this was the most effective sign locally that had worked there were people taking note of it and going wow this is the people actually taking photos of the sign uh, so i think signage is important but you but but the communication has to be thought through and certainly keep off the dictatorial end um and, and an explanation and of course it can't be too long-winded because people don't you know haven't got or they just don't well i don't you know you need it sort of quite succinct difficult to do but it can be done yeah uh, I, I would agree and i think it's particularly if you can do it with humor i've seen yes. some lovely ones that are like a cartoon uh, yes this was uh, actually in geneva on the lake and you know there's a duck uh, and throwing away this great stick of french bread and it's being picked up by a rat um, oh brilliant you know, it, have you got have you got would you like to share that with me sometime? You know that. Uh, yeah, picture? if I have you got if a picture? I can find it again. If you can dig it out, that'd be not. Yeah. I'll be. I'll be really interested in seeing it. But I have a serious question. You mentioned about the increase in urbanisation, and this might improve bird feeding. But a Oof. lot of the increase in urbanisation is in tower blocks where people have no access. They don't have balconies because the air quality and noise is such that they have to have what they call winter gardens which are totally yeah. enclosed so these people will not have any way of feeding birds you know personally no. they could go to a park but um so it's going against the i mean you need it's houses with gardens really is where people feed birds yes and that, and, and we've got to extend it out uh, you, you've hit the nail on the head absolutely absolutely uh but feeding our gardens is a private matter. It's not, it's not communicating how easy and cheap and successful it is and can be. I agree entirely, absolutely entirely. And this, you're dead right about the numbers. I'm not saying, I didn't say that urbanisation will improve, uh, but what I did say that the, the thoughts in the industry is that increased urbanisation goes hand in hand with increased profits for them. I didn't say improve necessarily yeah. bird feeding. Um, and I agree entirely, Marie, and you've hit, it, hit the nail on the head. You, this is, it's those people, it's a massive barrier. And it might, it's not necessarily a financial barrier. It's not necessarily an age barrier. And it's not necessarily an ethnicity issue. It's about access, as you quite rightly say. So we've got to do things to make it much more accessible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dean, you've got a hand up there. Uh, you're muted, Dean.
Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. How are you um, doing? Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Dave, for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering, you said there was a fruit gap in February. I was wondering, wouldn't it be a good idea to feed, the, presuming they would eat them, but feed the birds raisins? Yeah. That's not a problem. I think, I think what I, I mean, it's amazing when people talk to me and they go, I mean, this year I put up fat balls. Nothing's, nothing's used. I've got, I've got a neighbor three doors down, fat balls, they just go. Same fat balls, my God, and don't go. So what's going on there? Uh, and you get all these stories and people go, oh yeah, no, they love those. And then you try it and it doesn't work. So, I think within all this is trial and error. Just just do things, things that work for you, things that are easy for you, and things that work in your garden. Move the feeders, try, try different feed. Um, all those kinds of things. I, I, uh, I might try raisins. I mean, I keep hearing these stories about black cats. Put out, put out an apple, and a black cat will dominate your garden. Well, I've had a bl overwintering... I've been lucky enough to have an overwintering black cat from January to late Feb. Uh, every day for a couple of minutes, it won't go on the feeders, get scared off by blue tits. And when you put the, and the apple, it never touches. So I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer it, but I'll continue to mix and match and experiment. Um, and I do think it's a lot to do with, you know, shade, what bushes, what trees, what foliage you've got in the garden and how they perceive predation. It's going to be different in each garden. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So a bit of trial and error. And Dean, I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. Keep giving the rain. Yeah, have a go with the raisins. Why not? Oh, on raisins, a friend of mine has tried feeding raisins. Uh, she recommends soak them in water first. And black birds love them. There you go. Okay. Uh, hang on a minute, Caspian. We've got another one in the chat, in the chat here. Um, from Kate Walk. I thought, oh, I'm giving up. Um, the neighbour's cat sit on my garage roof and scare all the birds off. I think <laughs> they have a huge role to play. Yeah, we were. And us. Yeah, uh, I think they have a huge role to play in our decrease in numbers. Uh, don't know if you agree with that. <laughs> so, well, what, what is it? The, is it 55 million birds a year are predated by cats? That's the figure I've heard. They are the biggest pr pr predator of, of uh, birds, undoubtedly. Um, and dogs are not. Dogs are far behind, but uh, dogs in urban spaces are not particularly good when they're off the lead in a... In a, particularly in the nesting season, they're predators and also they cause disturbance. But it's cats that are a real issue. Uh, they are pretty, whether they, they're nice and cuddly and they love you lots and lick you and then they go and kill the blackbirds. It's particularly an issue, obviously, for shrub nesting birds. It's just takeaway for things like blackbirds, uh, sparrows. Um, the tree, tree nesting species, it's less of an issue, but certainly they go through enormous numbers of wrens, house sparrows and blackbirds and thrushes a year. Um, uh, now, I, I've actually been to a talk by an American professor who said that if you own a cat, uh, take it out on a lead. And most of us just went, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen, uh, especially as they're things that uh, like to roam of their own accord. Um, but certainly you can do what, be aware, more aware of them during nesting period, because that's the real, that's the real vulnerable time. And obviously a cat bell works. I've noticed in my garden, and uh, I suffer from cats all around, is that actually cats on uh, birds on the feeder they don't get 
because the birds are aware of them. You know, my feeders aren't deep within a bush. The birds are aware of, of any kind of movement and they just fly off and the cats can't get them. So it's when they're static on a nest is a different issue. Um, so yeah, make your cat noisy. Um, try and keep keep them um, indoors during certain uh, certain times. Um, that's about all we can, all I can think of um, that we can do. But it is an issue. It's undoubtedly they are the biggest predators of wild birds. So don't worry about the sparrow hawk taking a finch off your feeder. That's that's not an issue. <laughs> that's what happens. Okay, uh, Glynis. Yeah, I've uh, got a couple of feeders with the squirrel hoof, allegedly. I got one with a cage around it, and I've got a squirrel buster, but what happens is the feral pigeons manage to uh, with, with, with the one with the cage around it, they, they developed a method which I've never seen before. They hang on to the feeder, flap like mad, so they look like demented, enormous hummingbirds, and they get at the food. So I took that one down and I got a squirrel buster. That was okay for a while. And now the feral, feral pigeons fly at the squirrel buster feeder knock the food to the ground and eat the food. So uh, I've got some very well-fed uh, feral pigeons. Any ideas? Uh, well, well, enjoy the ingenuity of the pigeons, I would say. I think that's fascinating uh, uh, because that's part of the joy of bird feeding is enjoying the behaviour of these wonderful beasts. Um, I again, it's an age-old issue, and I'm, I suppose I'm lucky, really, because somebody just close to me feeds their birds on an open-top feeder, so they get all the parakeets, and uh, I don't have that problem. Um, but maybe, may, yeah, maybe ask your <laughs> neighbours, could you put out a bird feeder that's open table for the pigeons? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> That's one way around the problem. I, I, I don't know. I have no answers, uh, except what I said to Dean is every environment is different, even in our, some of our much smaller urban spaces, and do a bit of trial and error and see what you can do. In fact, actually, when I first moved into this house, we did have a pigeon. Uh, we had a lot more feral pigeons would come down and hoover up the sea, but there's less so. I think somebody redid their roof or something. If I think they've come they've come round to me. But you don't live very far from me and I've got your pigeons now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There is a lady who's also close to both of us and who I didn't actually interview for this project, but is a one I but I talked to her about bird seeding outside it. And she gets enormous pleasure every day out of feeding the birds. She stands in the middle of her garden. She's got a decent sized one for East Village. It's about 80 foot. She stands in the middle of the garden and she puts her hand out. She's got feed in her hands and she'll get up to, I've seen it, she'll get up to 40 pigeons actually just on her hands, her shoulders, and she adores it. She does get other species and she's a, she's, She's Dr. Doolittle. It's, she does, she talks to them uh, and it's fantastic. And she's not interested in getting a bird book and, and understanding the different species that are, because there are other species that go into a garden, but she gets absolutely, in, she does it every day. She, it's part of her life. It's really interesting. And no, she's not mad. She's, she's wonderful actually. Um, there you go. She loves her pigeons. <laughs> Natalie. Um, I'd like to say for, um, for the pigeons, just get a, a parakeet proof cage. Uh, I'm feeding the, um, the birds in the local cemetery 
and I had the problem with the parakeets and the pigeons doing exactly what you were describing and I found a parakeet proof cage there's only one place that does it I, I could find which is the vine house farm vine farm vine house farm yeah vine house farm it's but quite vine house sorry did you say vine house yeah oh yeah wow. And uh, it's quite expensive, but it has been absolutely fantastic. The, the, the parakeets have stopped and the pigeons can't do their, um, their uh, usual um, um, yeah, hummingbird thing, as you were calling it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Dulwich Park Initiative I mentioned has got cages, but they were purpose built because the feeders were... Uh, sort of one-off and the, and the way they're put up and they're not quite as effective as Natalie's but they have uh, inhibited to a, a large extent the parakeets uh, uh, so we don't have them just eating all the feed in a day. Uh, the jackdaws are still very clever and I quite like them being on the feeder anyway and the pigeons can only eat from the bottom of the feeder uh, it hasn't eliminated them but it's those feeders are so big let me think they're they're four foot high um that there's still access for tips and finches it's fine uh, as long as the bigger birds are just eating at the, the bottom of the feeder but they're really expensive those feeders were <laughs> um catherine um, to come back to the issue of feeding bread in parks to um, particularly water birds, um, I've always thought that cafes in parks, and so many parks do have cafes, cafes are they're missing a trick that they should be encouraged to sell bags of grain, bird seed. Yeah, uh, Catherine. Um... That used to happen at the cafe in uh, Dulwich Park um, <clears throat> when it was under private ownership. It was uh, uh, two sisters owned it, but they sold out to the people who owned the cafe franchises in Richmond Park, which seemed to be spreading. The coffee's awful. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they're mo much more of a bigger company. And I, I think they have been approached. Uh, the reason it's not as easy as all that, there, there, there is some barriers to that, but it is a good idea to have a word uh, because you're right. Um, because, it, it, you know, the, the selling point is it increases um, flow of people into their cafe. Oh, can I have some birds? Oh, I'll have a copy as well. Um, so, yes, it, it is a good idea. Yeah, we do. But you have won't, they, you won't always get a yes, though. Let me let me warn you. Yeah, the cafe in Brotwell Park sells bird feed for the ducks. You've Ooh. then got to advertise it as well, somehow. Yeah, uh, you need an advert on the railing. That's right. Of the lake, yeah. instead of, yeah. as you say, yeah. being negative and do not feed bread. You can have a nice notice saying, we prefer grain. The cafe will, will... Yeah, they like you as well. <laughs> yes, go to the cafe and buy yeah. some. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we got any more? Uh, I don't see any more questions. Oh, uh, John. Yeah, but I, I, earlier, I, I, think I, I just um, need to get a, a glass of water. My throat's just run dry. Okay. Just bear with me. Okay. Yeah, as I was saying, in Brotwell Park, the, the cafe has uh, wised on to that one, Catherine. And um, yeah, 50p a bag. Come and get I'm it. Back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm back. Marie, you could have a go at Chiswick House Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, Dave, thanks. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, great subject and fascinating. Um, I just wanted to say um, my thoughts, even in my own experience, now that we're in Marlow and seeing quite a lot of different birds, is it just makes one appreciate all animals more. And I wonder if that came across to you in, you know, all your questioning talks and investigations, if people 
if you came across that feeling as well. Un, un, absolutely, undoubtedly, and that that undoubtedly there are, there was several things that happened. It's more like if you do it, you're more likely to join a, a some kind of green group. Uh, you might participate in You're more likely to participate in volunteering. You're more likely to join a wildlife trust. You're more likely to join the RSPB. You're more likely to join the BTO. It does act as a stepping stone to those sort of conservation initiatives and you are right there is this it, it's this unfulfilled potential if you if you do get people interested in something uh, it's, it's like anything if you engage somebody in cars or car mechanics if you engage people in photography if you trigger something in any kind of en 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 project um, you engage people all that happens is you up, you keep up in your game um, so you get interested in butterflies. Oh, I think I'll get a butterfly book. It's a natural thing um, that we are inquisitive, but, you, but you've got to get that leap up and get people to understand that it's not too cool for school. Actually, it's very cool. Um, those sort of barriers, break those barriers down. And you're right. It just, you can, there is a, some kind of snowball effect. But important, the other important thing and you, you probably came out my other talk is this snowball effect is also um it's also an emotional thing the more you understand and the more you can name or the more you get involved the more you engage in anything you do the more you care the more you get frustrated yes but the more you care and that that's really really important because if we're getting more and more people caring about our environment it's you know it, that's a powerful 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 thing this is what i was getting to exactly that you know it doesn't mean because you're feeding a pigeon you get interested in a sparrow it's hopefully a much broader spectrum and that you begin to appreciate i mean i've always loved animals anyway so it's not changed me but even this little bit of extra appreciation of different species has made me even that much more aware of our planet you know yeah. across the board even maybe uh, cockatoo in you know, the andes or wherever they are from yeah. um it doesn't matter it just makes it, it makes you maybe it's me getting older as well but you know that and might be part connected. Of and if we help a bird here and care for something and sign a petition and all that you know everything's connected and it all helps yeah it is and i'm gonna pat you back thank you <laughs> i'll pay yours well done <laughs> right I, I think uh that's probably it dave so thank you very very much for that talk and thank you everybody for all your questions that's been a really interesting evening uh oh something from chris ashby down there oh it's a, that's applause okay um oh. <laughs> so I would, suggest, I would suggest everybody unmute themselves and uh we give dave a round of applause if, if you can do that <laughs> thank you you're too kind <laughs>